You ever set out to do a task in life, a project? You get going in that project, and you're all excited about it, and man, you're going to do this, you're going to do that, and you start getting into the project, and you realize, well, I didn't have the brain power to really do this. <laughs> I've been there, done that, or you just, you didn't have the equipment to, to accomplish what you wanted to accomplish. I've done that too many times, and so you keep working at the project, you keep working at the task, you keep going at it, and then you start getting overwhelmed, very overwhelmed. And then after you become overwhelmed, you become discouraged, and you, you put it aside for a little bit, then you take it up again, then you put it aside again, and then eventually, guess what? You shelve the thing. And then you get discouraged. You, get, like, you look inside and you say, why, why couldn't I accomplish that? Why couldn't I do that? Well, take that from the physical and let's put it into the spiritual, okay? Maybe you want to know God in a greater way. So you say, I'm going to spend time with him. Get up in the morning, and the uh, alarm goes off. You set it for an hour earlier, and you say, I'm going to accomplish this. I'm just going to spend time and sit there with the Lord. You wake up. What's the first thing that you do? Because I, I know you've done this. Well, maybe I should start with 45 minutes. So you hit the snooze button, right? And then you wake up at 45 minutes and you say, well, I think I might have bit off a little more than I chewed. Let's do a half hour. Hit the snooze button. And then you get back up after that. A half hour's gone already. You get up and you start thinking, why did it? I'll start this tomorrow. You know? Or you want to dig deeper into God's Word. So you get out all your study helps and you sit down and you, you put everything out on the table and... Um, all of a sudden, everything that can comes against you. The doorbell rings, your phone rings, you get a text, or you just got to look at the text, you know that, right? Uh, or the emergency vehicles outside, some, something's going on. There's always a dis- disruption of some sort. Know what I'm talking about. Or you make these great plans, I'm going to start serving the Lord in this way, or I'm going to start serving the Lord in that way, or do this or do that. And you start making all these plans, but you never really get to walk out the plans. And what do you do? You get discouraged, and you start beating yourself up, and you just leave it alone, and you walk away from it. We've all done that. Every, every one of us have been guilty of doing that. Maybe right now in your life, you're not disappointed with you, but you're just disappointed with God. Maybe God didn't show up in a way that you thought he would show up in a situation in your life. And you became just disappointed with God. Been there, done that myself. You've lost the vision that God gave you. Maybe you've lost a hope that you had. You just feel empty. And his promises seem empty. You ever been there? At some times in your life, God's promises are just powerful. Man, you see them coming true. And then other times it's like, why isn't that happening? Why isn't that happening? I've been faithful. I've been patient. And you get discouraged and you finally just you start losing hope. You're ready to give up. You're ready to call it quits. And if you've ever been there, it's tough. It feels like you're in some spiritual holding pattern that you can't ever land. You just can't get down on the ground where you need to be. Or it feels like you're, you're in quicksand. And I've never been in quicksand, but what I've heard is you make a move forward, you're going down further. You know, or you're in this whirlpool that's going around. And as it goes around, guess what? It's sucking you towards that center and that center's got a big old hole, so it's going to just eat you alive. That's what it feels like. It feels like you just can't move forward. Well, if that's where you are today, then God has a word of encouragement for you. There are so many reasons why people just quit in their faith. They give up in their faith. They get so discouraged. I mean, there's, there's a mountain of reasons. I could list them all for you, but I'm not going to. But we just get to that point where we feel like we're, we're no longer drawing closer to God. We're no longer being effective for his kingdom. It frustrates us. And so we live in a, a state of defeat. And I know that's not where you want to be. And I know for sure that's not where God wants you to be. You want to be able to overcome whatever's in front of you, that sin in your life, that temptation. You want to be able to be used for God and for his glory to give him the praise. You want to be just vibrant in your faith. But you find yourself just sitting in this pit, this pit of despair, and you can't get out. Listen to me when I'm telling you today, it's time for you to get out of that pit. 
It's time to move forward. We cannot sit there any longer. It's time to press forward and find a new path towards your relationship in God, towards your service in God. And it's going to take every bit of your physical, emotional, and spiritual effort to do it. And if you just sit there and do nothing, nothing's going to happen. You put forth no effort, you gain no ground. And the evil one loves that. We've got to be like the five wise virgins. Think about this. You know, we have times of tribulation right around the corner that we don't even know about. You think you got it tough now with the things that you experience in life? It's nothing compared to what is going to come upon the face of this earth. And if we are not prepared like, for that time, we're going to be like the five foolish virgins. We ain't got no, we're not going to have any oil in our lamp to go forth in strength during that time. As you know, our, our spiritual journey is a process, and that process, during that process, it's almost a given that you're going to get bogged down. You're going to get stuck somewhere. We've all done that. We're going forward for a good period of time, and all of a sudden we hit something, and it's different for everybody, and it just stops us. And so maybe I don't know where each one of you are, just like you don't know where I am, but I remember when God was in the wooing process in my life that he was drawing me unto himself. I was 17 years old. I just finished high school. I was living the life of luxury. I was, I was sharing a, broom, a room with my 19-year-old brother. It was great, you know? Living at, that was a joke, y'all. Come on. <laughs> my 19, you'd have to know my older brother. He's never wrong. So, sorry, Al, but it's the truth. But um, anyway, sharing a room with my older brother. My grandfather from Sicily had taken my room, so he was staying in my room. And he had every complaint possible. You never wanted to say, hey, Pops, how you doing? Because if you didn't have an hour, you were stuck there for a while. So, wow. But anyway, 17 years old, and I just thought, I need some independence. I need to get out of the house. You know, and I was worldly. I wasn't a believer. And uh, so as I'm seeking my independence, as God always does, he's seeking for me to be dependent upon him. So there's a friend down the street. And they said, well, come on and stay with me. I got an extra room, and that's fine. I'm, but I, I think I moved a quarter mile. <laughs> you know, you got to start small. I, gotta, I tell you, you got to start small, small steps here. But uh, so I go down the street, and I remember a couple nights after being there, they sat down, and they started sharing with me the gospel of the kingdom. Uh, now, I had been raised in church, but they shared it in a way that it clicked. It was like, oh, wow, I know the role of God the Father. I know the role of Yeshua. I know the role of the Ruach HaKodesh. I know the role of angels. I know, the, I know my role now. I mean, this is, this is great. And then I got mad, and I said, well, why didn't anybody ever share this with me? I know people that are Christians. I know people that are believers. Why didn't they tell me this? You know, I'm going on the road to hell, and I don't even know it. Nobody even cares, it seems like. So, man, I'm in the wooing process now. God's drawing me. I can feel it. And then, guess what? Life happens again. 17 years old, uh, I start working with my dad independently, and of course, the riches of the world take my mind somewhere else. So, kind of fades away. Then I started dating Lynn a couple years later, and Lynn's been my wife 35 years. We've known each other 38 years. And uh, her family's that time into spiritual things. <clears throat> Excuse me, and my mom and dad are starting to look into spiritual things. And so there's the wooing process again. God starts putting an interest in me as well. So I start looking into the things of God again. Don't know what happened. You know, came up for a while, then it died down. Here we are, you know, three years and nothing's going on. What's going on? You know, I'm one of those tough nuts to crack. Johnny knows. He works with me. But uh, get married at 20 years old to Lynn. And um, then uh, about a year and a half into our marriage, Lynn becomes pregnant with Ryan. That's Ryan right next to her. Anyway, if you don't know Ryan, my, son, my oldest son, our oldest son. But um, during that time, that's where God really just, boom, he just hit me hard. And I started becoming so interested in the word of God that it just, I couldn't put it down. It didn't matter where I was. I'd take it to work. And, uh, of course, I'm glad we had a family business that I was able to sit there and, hey, at any break time, I would sit and research the word and cross-reference stuff. And, and I found myself organizing stuff in a way that I was able to share it with people. And um, six years, I have to sit there and think. It was six years be- before the, the time when God started to woo me until the time that I, I actually came to faith in him. 
And that's where some of y'all might be in that process and you're, you're getting tripped up. You're being drawn to the things of God. And then there's something in your path that is keeping you from fully coming to him. Let me tell you, don't stop. If you're listening to my voice, don't stop. God has so many good things in store for you. I don't even want to know what I would have become without the Lord in my life. So keep pressing on and don't quit. He is the very lover of your soul. And nobody can love him. Nobody can love you like he loves you. So keep pressing on. He has so many good things in store for you. Well, anyhow, let's get back to this. There's another process that uh, we go through when we become a believer, and it's called the sanctification process. All right? You get born again, and you have to start growing. That's right. You can't remain an infant your whole life. I'm sorry, but that's the truth. You know, we tell our kids to grow up. Well, guess what? There's a lot of us that are sitting out here and hearing my voice that are not growing up, staying in the same spot. It's time to move on. Well, why do we need this? Well, we've got to, we've got to change because we're a mess when you think about it when we first come to the Lord. And there's so much garbage and, excuse me, but crap in our life that just needs to get out. All right? God's got to get it out. He's got to form that spiritual man, that spiritual woman that he's always desired to see in you. So, but this time is filled with such adversities. It's filled with difficulties. It's filled with trials. It's filled with tribulations. It's filled with all these things that in the flesh we don't want, right? We push away from these things. But God says, these are the very things that I'm going to use to mold, to shape, to get rid of the garbage out of your life and, put the, and build you up into a spirit man or to a spirit woman that I desire. So God is going to use these adversities to cut away the things that you don't need in your life. Why do we fight it? I don't know. <laughs> but there are people that get in the sanctification process, and God's using these mountains in their, their lives, and he's using these tribulations and trials, and they just get to that point. They just become so discouraged. They, get, they feel like I said in the beginning, like they're in a pit, and they can't get out. There's no ladder to get out of the pit. Or then that whirlpool being sucked around, and they're getting ready to go down. Or they're in that quicksand. And maybe that's where you are. But God doesn't want you to remain there. Spiritually speaking, God doesn't want you in that holding pattern. He wants you to move forward. But let me tell you from the onset, it's going to take some work. It's hard work. It really is truly hard work. As, as, an, early believe, as, excuse me, as an earlier believer, I want to share something with you. I had a terrible time. Some people know me, but a lot of people don't know me. But I want to share this because I know someone is struggling in some way. When I first came to the Lord, like I said, I had a desire. I just couldn't put his word down. I mean, I'd pick it up every moment I could. I would cross-reference stuff. I'd have, I had books started everywhere, of different studies and, and things. And then I would share it with people at work. I'd share it with people on the job. And, uh, you know, I, I worked in construction, so... I had the rough crew. I was always sharing with my tile and marble setter or the concrete guys and stuff and, you know, those kind of rough guys. And we still work with rough people today, Johnny. And I was like, I haven't graduated from there. God's got me there for some reason, you know, being able to, to share with them what was shared with me. And so um, I start doing these things and I start realizing, because people start telling me, and they said, God's given you a gift. You can organize stuff in a way, and then you can present it in a way that it makes sense, or, or it can be very encouraging. And I said, well, that's cool. That's great. But also, what they didn't know, but that I knew internally, is that I struggled with tremendous inner problems. <laughs> Let me tell you this. I had anxieties like you never could understand. I could not even stand up before a group of people. It was so debilitating. If I got up here when I first became a believer, you would see my hand shake. You'd see my heart pounding out of my chest. You'd see every bit of nervousness that you could. And it was so debilitating. I couldn't do nothing for the Lord. So as God's telling me to push this forward, I'm saying, no, I want to go hide behind the scenes. I don't want to be out front. I want to shut up and say nothing. So what did I do? I retracted into my shell like I always did back then and did nothing. And for a short period of time, maybe a couple of years, I saw myself as very ineffective for the kingdom of God. And then one day, I just got discouraged. I was like, man, I love doing this stuff. Why can't I get out there? Why? It felt like a cruel gift that God gave me. 
the two dichotomies here. You know, I want to do it, but inside of me, my flesh says, I'm not going to do it. I got to the point where I was discouraged. I really was. I was like in this, that pit of despair, and I didn't want to move forward in my relationship with God. I just wanted to stay there and accept mediocrity in my faith. But one day I remember I just said, no, I'm pushing forward. I'm putting forth the effort. I'm going to see what God does in this thing. I'm going to see what he can do with me. That was the adversity. That was the, the, the tribulation coming into my life, as you can say. Little did I know, but God had a plan. <laughs> this, is, this is so God. He was going to use the very gifting that he put within my life to cause me to die to my flesh. Okay? We see these adversities, we see these trials, we see these struggles and tribulations as just those. But we don't see it as the thing that God can use to mold and shape us into the image of Messiah. He was going to call, he was going to use this gifting to help me to overcome my feelings of inadequacy, my fears, my anxieties, my panic attacks I was having, and I gave him time. He was going to cause me to depend on him and his spirit and not myself. And finally, he was going to use this gift, like I said, to grow me into the image of Messiah. So the very thing that I feared doing for God was the very thing that was going to bring me free from myself and my flesh. And like I said, it hasn't been easy. Ask any believer who's per- been persecuted for their faith. Where did the power, where did the strength come from? All right? From the Spirit of God within them, first and foremost. Ask any believer that, you know, how, how, that's been persecuted. How did they go back and treat their, tor- their tormentors with kindness and love? Only by the power and the strength of God's Spirit within them. Now, They didn't have to go back and love them. They didn't have to go back and do anything else. But but there are those that have, and they've seen changes in their tormentor's life. It's only by the power of God's Spirit within you, and then your effort to take that step forward and to walk it out. Now, if they were tormented and did nothing, and or reviled or, or yelled back in the flesh, it might have been a different story. But they, they operated by the power of the Spirit, and God used them through the love of God to maybe change the life of their tormentor. Heard about it all the time. It's only by the power of God's Spirit. You see, this is a two-part operation, and we, we fail to see that. We think that God just equips us with the power of the Spirit, and we can walk it out. But you can't walk it out unless you put some sort of effort. You know, faith by itself is not good. Faith is like just going to the gym and you open the door and you say, I'm in the gym, right? I'm in the gym, right? That's great. You're in the gym. What's going to happen? Nothing unless you do something. You know, at one point in our lives, we've stood in the wrath of God. And God, when we placed our faith and trust in him, he takes us from that place of wrath and puts us in his grace. We stand in grace right now. And it's the same thing, like I said, with your faith. You are, you are in grace now. But does that mean you're going to grow up? Does that mean you're going to be a, 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 a victorious in your walk? No. You've got to put forth the effort. Just like when you go in that gym. You better get on the treadmill. You better get on the stair stepper. You better pick up those weights. You better have a game plan, an action plan to grow yourself. If you don't, you're going to be staying right where you're at. I believe that God wants you to go from here today, those of you that are struggling, with the confidence that no matter what you face, no matter what comes across in your life, that you can, if you start adding to your faith, more so than just believing that you're going to be victorious in what lies in your life right now. Let me say that what we need to do is to do Do two things. Well, well, it's really two words, excuse me. There's two words that I want to share with you today. They're called simple addition. Simple addition. Am I not seeing the stuff on the screen? Where's the word? I guess I skipped John 44. There we are, but that's okay. You can go read John 44. I want to talk to you today about simple addition. We're going to get to it, but we're not going to get to it right away. I guess I didn't stick to this, but that's okay. That's no problem. The rest of of today and the next Shabbat, what I want to do is lay out a game plan for you to get you moving forward in your life. It's kind of like 
I'm your gym instructor here, all right? We're going to get you guys a little game plan that are struggling. I want to give you the tools to get you from just crawling like a baby to a flat-out sprint, all right? We've got to learn to crawl before we can even stand up. Isn't that true? You watch a baby, and you got, that baby's got to learn to stand steadily on his feet, and you've watched him take a step or two and fall, and you're going to fall, there's no doubt. But you've got to learn to stand before you can walk, and you've got to learn to walk before you can run, and you've got to learn to run before you can just flat-out sprint. So hopefully you will get the tools, you'll get something to get you moving forward and out of that pit where you're at. Before we do, what I want to do is give you a, um, just a little background on what we're going to be talking around about today. We're going to be looking into the two letters of Shimon Kepha, and predominantly the second letter, and we'll get to that mostly next week. But a uh, little background, it's about 66 or 67 AD. We know that the temple in Jerusalem is still standing at that time. And the gospel is going forth out into the known world. And as it does, people are placing their faith and trust in Messiah. But guess what? They're also being persecuted for their faith. And so Kepha sits down and he writes these letters to encourage the believers that no matter what you're going through, God is still there. God is still going to provide for you. And he's given you so much. I want you to see also, he says, all the things that God has given you. So... They've ha- they were having their homes taken from them. They were having their property taken from them. They were being forced to just keep moving on. And before he became a believer, that's what Shaul was doing. He was getting letters, and he was going out, and he was persecuting the believers and forcing them from their homes, wherever they lived. So, so he was writing to these believers who, who are scattered throughout the Roman Empire because of their faith. And uh, at that time, I couldn't imagine being a believer you know, going through that kind of persecution. And all I'd probably want to do was lay low at the time. You know, hey, just let's be a quiet believer, you know. So, and on top of that, guess what? There's, there's so many false prophets that are going around because Kepha talks about that as well. These wolves in sheep's clothing trying to mislead the people. Look at the mention of all the difficulties uh, in, the, uh, in the letter of First Peter. Distressed by various trials. You've been called for this purpose since Messiah also suffered for you, leaving you an example for you to follow in his steps. So you're going to be suffering. If you should suffer for the sake of righteousness, you're blessed. Do not fear their intimidation. Don't, don't be troubled. The thing which you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior, since Messiah has suffered in the flesh, arm yourself also with the same purpose. It's going to happen. Next screen. And then these two passages as well. Don't be surprised at the fiery ordeal among you. Uh, which comes upon you for the t- your testing. If you are reviled for the name of Messiah, you are blessed. After you have suffered for a little while. Powerful passages that let us know that, yeah, they suffered for their faith. And we, that could be right around the corner for us too. We don't know. So Kepha sits down and he writes them uh, words of encouragement in these two letters. And he wants them, he wants to remind them that they have to put some things into practice to move their faith forward, to be victorious, you know, to be able to keep pressing on. You can't sit still long or else you're going to get swept over. There's no doubt. So in his first letter, uh, in uh, 1-1, Kepha starts out and he says, Kepha, an apostle of Yeshua Messiah, to those who reside as aliens scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, who are chosen. The very first thing that he wants to state to them, and and he wants them to remember, and you need to remember, it doesn't matter what you're experiencing, what you're facing, you are still God's chosen, regardless of what you're going through, regardless of how high that mountain seems or how deep that pit seems, you are still God's chosen. The believers were being forced from their home, like I said, being persecuted, their property taken, their houses taken, and even today... As I'm speaking, I know that this message could possibly reach some of these countries where believers are having that same thing done to them by extremists and radicals. And I want to encourage you as well. You are God's chosen. Don't ever give up on that. God has set you aside. Whether you're a natural branch or you're grafted in, you are God's chosen. And some of you that are sitting here today have left homes. I know some of you all have. I've talked to you. You've left places and you've come and moved here. And a lot of you have ran into that, that mindset of, man, I'm lonely now. I don't have my family like I had back then. I don't have the friends I have back then. But God's called you to do something. 
And I want to encourage you to keep pressing on, keep going forward in what God's called you to do. It might be discouraging at a moment here and there, but he's got a purpose. He's got a plan. You're here for a reason, and don't give up. So you feel lonely. Let me just say this. It doesn't matter if you feel lonely. We are never going to fit into this world. This, this place is not our home. Sometimes we lose focus of that. Our mind goes back to just wanting something tangible to hold on to or something tangible to, to be able to relate to. But God's saying, this isn't your home. We are going to have a home one day. You see, Yeshua is preparing something great for all of us. We belong to a kingdom that is not of this world. There is a day where we will fit in. As Daniel says, as the book of Revelation tells us, that, that one day God's great kingdom will come upon the face of this earth. And Yeshua will reign, rule and reign with right, righteousness. And guess what? Who's going to be there with him? You and I are going to be there with him. So think about that. Keep that in the forefront of your mind. He's preparing a special place for us right now. Yeshua said in John 14, 1 through 3, he says, Don't let your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house, well, there are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you. For I go to prepare a place for you. If I go and prepare a place for you, I will, and I underlined that in mind, I will come again and receive you to myself. That where I am, you may also be. In the future restoration of all things, when God creates a new heaven, God creates a new earth, what he's going to do is bring that new Jerusalem down to this earth. And all that you see right now, it's going to fade. It's going to fade from memory. It's going to be destroyed. Isaiah 65, 17 tells us, for behold, I create a new heaven and a new earth and the former things, well, they're not going to be remembered. They're not going to come to mind. And then in Revelation 21, 2 and 10, he reminds us of the new Jerusalem. And I saw the holy city, new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, made ready as a bride, adorned for her husband. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven. And if you got time today, please, and this is your day of rest, spend it with the Lord. Go read Revelation 21. It's funny because when Rabbi was talking about this last Shabbat, I was like, hey, you're stealing that passage I wanted to share. But that's okay because I know what's going on. God is driving something home. When God repeats something, he's driving a point home. And a lot of you need to hear this. A lot of you are discouraged. You're facing mountains that I can't even imagine. And so... Go home and read it. You have something great in store for you. God is doing a a powerful work behind the scenes we don't even see. All right. Where are we? Revelation (laughs) 21.10. Okay. Hebrews 13.14 says, For here we don't have a lasting city, but we are seeking that city which is to come. Come, Yeshua, come. We are so ready. So if you're struggling because you feel like you don't fit in, that God's moved you somewhere, or you're being forced from your home, literally, that's okay. God's got something better prepared for you. God's got something so far greater than you could have ever imagined. Nothing's ever going to compare. Kepha continues to encourage encourage the believers in the next passage. Uh, He he reminds them that God in his great mercy has caused them to be born again to a living hope. As opposed to a dead hope, we have a living hope. And as opposed to a lot of people in the world that have no hope in ho- at all, we have a living hope. And so don't forget that. And it's not possible without the resurrection of Messiah. And if you're connected to Messiah Yeshua, then guess what? That promise is for you and for every believer. That's right. We too shall rise from the dead. If that's not enough, let's look at what God's going to give us. He says he's going to give us an inheritance, an inheritance. You can go back to that one. Is it in there? Yeah, it's in there, down towards the bottom. An inheritance, and he describes this inheritance as imperishable. Is nobody going to destroy it. What God creates and what God sets forth in motion, nobody can destroy. It's undefiled. That means nothing unclean is ever going to enter into it. Nothing. And it will not fade away, and it's a reserve for us in heaven. God is doing a tremendous work for us. Keep this in the forefront of your mind if you're discouraged right now. Don't let the world steal your joy. Don't let the evil one steal your joy. 
Yeah, you might have messed up. You might keep giving into that sin. But guess what? One day you are going to be victorious over that temptation. One day you're going to be victorious over that sin. I know you will. With that in mind, let's look at how, let's go into Kepha's second letter. Many encouragements from the, from the first letter. But he says in one one, he says, to those who have received a faith of the same kind as ours. You know, with God, there's nothing new when you think about this. There's nothing new in the world. The same faith that Kepha received, the same faith that the apostles received, guess what? We're sharing in that same faith. It's powerful when you think about that. There's nothing new. There's nothing that's changed over the, the couple thousands of years since that faith was established. It's still the same. It's no different. It's just as powerful. It's just as active. It's just as encouraging. It's just as whatever. You name it, it's just as it's the same. It hasn't changed. What they had, we have today. What they experienced, we can experience today. Nothing's changed. The power that they saw, guess what? You can see it today if you keep pressing forward, if you keep walking. And how did they receive this faith? Kepha says, by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Yeshua, Messiah. Our faith is not of our own making. And if you, and if you think you're the one that has established it and this is your doing, you are just totally off base. It is anything we have is given to us by the Father, even the very righteousness, because you know that our righteousness is as a filthy menstrual rag, as the scripture really says. It's as dung on the face of the earth. Okay, so we need the very righteousness of God. We need that to change us. So he imparts this righteous righteousness to us. And just thinking about that, that to me is beyond a blessing. Kepha says, in the next passage, 1-2, he says, Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Yeshua, our Messiah, and of Yeshua, Messiah, our Lord. Kepha knew that these believers, well, they were suffering. And what did they need? They needed grace and they needed peace. And some of y'all, like I said, are suffering greatly and you need God's grace and you need God's peace. This word, uh, be multiplied, is an interesting word. It's used in the optative mood. I like to research tenses, moods, and voices of the languages because to me they give color to the language. They give understanding. It makes it clear to me what the, the inspired uh, writings are actually saying here. And the optative mood is a mood that conveys a hope for something to happen. Outside of the true knowledge of God and of Yeshua and of his spirit, you and I would not know what true grace and true peace is. We may search for it in our struggles, but we're never going to know what it is unless we're remaining in that relationship with God. So if you're struggling in any way, I truly, I truly say this, cry out to God for his grace and peace. That's one thing we don't do. We just sit there and we just, it's like we're sitting and letting these waves just keep hitting us. Waves of despair, waves of difficulty, waves of trouble. And we never put any effort forward. And God is saying in his word, cry out to me. I want to pour this into your life. I want to move you from point A to point B. I want to get you out of the state that you feel in. You've got to put forth the effort. You cannot sit still. The, the, the evil one will just eat your lunch. I Believe it or not, as short as I am, as small as I am, I played football when I was young. And I was a nose guard, and I was just a mean little sucker. I was probably, I, I was, I weighed just as much now as I did when I was like 10 years old. So they always put me at nose guard. And, and I had this one coach, and he'd always get in my face, you get that guy or he's going to eat your lunch. And I was just, that made me even more mad. So i just get out there and do what I had to do. And um, that's the way the evil one is. He will eat your lunch. And he'll eat more than your lunch. He'll eat your life and your very soul if you let him do it. Anyhow, Kepha goes on. Let's move on. Um, in 1.3, he goes on to tell us that God provides everything, everything that you will need. And you need to hear this. You really do. If you're stuck somewhere, you need to hear this. It's through his divine power that he grants us everything we need, everything need that we need pertaining to life and to godliness. It's not through your power. It's not through your strength. So if you're looking within or if you're looking to someone else, give it up. Look to God. Look at what he pertains. The first thing it says that he, he well, look what he provides. The first thing he says he provides for us is life. 
zoe. This is anything in the physical that needs to be met. It is not your job. If you're struggling, you just keep losing job after job. Guess what? That's God's job to provide something for you too. You got to get out there and make the effort. It's a two-part operation, remember? But he's going to put you exactly where he wants you. He's going to settle you exactly where he needs you to be a light, to be salt to someone. So if you need food, you need shelter, you need clothing, you need deliverance, you need safety, you need protection, this is God's doing in the physical. But this is the one I like, everything pertaining to godliness. Godliness, eusebion in the Greek, it means piety towards God, holiness. It means to venerate God, to pay homage to God, to reverence God or to be devoted to God in what you think, in what you say, in what you do. It covers every area of your life, not just one. It covers every area of your life. And how does God, how does God's divine power grant these to us? Well, he goes ahead and he explains it in verse 3. So go back to verse 3. He says, through the true knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and his excellence. This couple of passages are so heavy, y'all. I'm telling you, they are full of so much stuff. And they should give you a world of encouragement to keep pressing on. Not by a false or distorted knowledge, but not by some secretive or special knowledge, but by the true knowledge that's contained in his very word. All right? And it's not only contained in his very word, it's, crea- it's, it's contained in creation itself. Creation reveals the greatness, the true knowledge of God. Romans 1.20 says, For since the creation of the world... His invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen. They've been clearly seen. Every man, every woman is without excuse. The true knowledge of God is revealed in his creation. It's revealed in the very life of Yeshua, no doubt about it. And and it has been testified to us by the apostles and the prophets and the people down through the ages as well. The, The Ruach given to us testifies of God's very true knowledge of himself. All these things point back to God the Father. They reveal his true knowledge. But look at the power of this one word that Kepha uses here. He's inspired to to write this down. It says, seeing that his divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness. The Greek word granted here means to give or to bestow freely upon. Okay? That means that everything that God gives us pertaining to life, everything that God gives us pertaining to godliness, it's a free gift. It's given to you as a free gift. And what I like about this word in the Greek, it's in the perfect tense. And you're like, so what's a perfect tense mean? Listen up. God doesn't allow a word to be written down unless it's inspired by him. The perfect tense conveys two things. It conveys an action that is completed sometime in the past. All right? When did God grant these to us? I'd say before the foundation of the world. Because he knew when he created man, he knew that man was going to rebel, and he knew that man was going to walk away. So he had to set in motion before the foundation of the world, all right, I got to give them everything pertaining to life and to godliness, or else they're going to be lost their whole life. They're going to, we are like sheep. There's no doubt. We're going to find ourselves upside down, never to be righted up unless God gets involved. So, excuse me, that's only one part it conveys. Something that was done at a specific point in time in the past. But what does it have? It conveys also enduring results. When he set that into motion, that means it was available for Adam and his family as soon as they were kicked out of the garden. That means it was available for all the prophets that proclaimed Messiah before he came and all the believers back then under the, uh, the older covenant. It was available for everybody at the time of Messiah. It's available to everybody between the time of Messiah and now and before and until he comes. This will continue to be available to everybody that places their faith, their trust, their hope in him. So don't give up. Keep pressing forward. God has given you so much. He's provided everything you need. That should make you want to get up and dance. That should make you want to get going and go forward. I am a flatline person. Every test I take personality, right in the middle. I'm not real low, and I'm not a high, high. I'm like right in the middle. I'm like, that's kind of boring a lot, you know. 
But when you see stuff like this, it motivates you to say, wow, God has given us much more than we could ever imagine. Much, much more. The problem is we believe the evil one. He's told you you're no good. He's told you you're now, you keep sinning in this area. You're, you're no longer useful for the Father. Just stay where you're at. Just lay low. Don't press forward. You mean nothing to him anymore. You're just a vessel that once was and isn't now. But that's a lie from the pit of hell. And as Yeshua said, he's the father of lies. So I'm going to believe Yeshua on this one. And I'm not going to believe the evil one when he puts those thoughts into my mind. Keep your head up. Keep pressing on. This verse is not finished. <laughs> it's got a lot to it. Look at what God has called you to. This is something God has called you to. I'm like, why would you do this, God? But this is, this is just who he is. He says he's called you to two unbelievable things, his glory and his excellence. Why would God want to share his glory with us? Why would God want us to share in this glory and to share in this excellence? Only he can answer that. Don't ask me. But I'm glad he did. The Greek word for glory is the word doxa. And it, this is God's splendor. This is his grandeur. It can, per, it can pertain to anything in his kingdom, his praise, his honor. But God says, I want you to share in this. I do. I want you to share in this with me. Who else that comes into riches is going to share that much with you? Nobody that I know. But he doesn't stop there. He says, I want you to share in my excellence. This is what I've called you to. The Greek word, arete. And this is God's moral excellence, his goodness. Why would God call me a nobody, a sinner, someone who opens his mouth and inserts his foot on a daily basis and then regrets it and repents to share in this? That's just the loving God that we serve. And don't forget, you're, you're down the pit, don't forget, this is for you. This is especially for you. Verse 4, he says, for by these he has granted to us his precious and magnificent promises. What are the these that Keith is referring to here? Well, they're back in verse 3. By God's divine power, by the righteousness that he imparts to us, by him granting us everything we need pertaining to life and godliness, by, us, by the, the granting of the true knowledge of him, his, his Ruach, and Yeshua himself, God has given you every single thing you need. And what has he granted to us, he says here? His precious and magnificent promises. Let's look at these words because these are unbelievable. Precious means Valuable, of great worth, held in high honor, highly respected, priceless. And I like this one, rare. There's nobody like our God. There is nobody like our God. Magnificent, of high status, of the highest status, it really means. And these promises, this is what's interesting about God's promises. They are not in, in response to any petition you made or that I made. No, these are voluntary God says, I want to bless my people. I want to have mercy. I want to have compassion. I want to show them grace. That's from a heart of love, of true love. We didn't petition him for it. That's the God we serve. All right. He hasn't been forced. He hasn't been coerced. He's just done it out of his kindness. And they are a reality in our life. Thank God. So why has God granted these precious and magnificent promises to us? Let's read on in verse 4. In order that by them, you might become, oh boy, partakers of divine nature. Are you serious? God wants us to be partakers of divine nature. How many times have you read over that and you're thinking, no way, not me. Yes way, you. God wants you to be a partaker of his divine nature. You see, it was our sin that kept us from that. God wants us to, to have that in a, as part of our life. But sin will keep you from that. There's no doubt. And now in Messiah, these are yours to share in. It's unbelievable. Here comes the most interesting part. I want to go back to what we talked about, the, the, the simple addition. Here comes our part in the relationship with God. Here's what we bring to the table. Here's what we have to do. All right? The verb, go back to uh, verse 4, or it could be in the next slide. Hey, listen, I didn't tell Roxanne to put these on 11 pages. She's the one that kept decided to put the same verse on different pages. So if your printer's crying out, get Roxanne. <laughs> or you could be like my wife. She printed it out and left it at work. <laughs> oh, Johnny! 
Well, you guys both owe Polymer Valley 22 pages of paper, okay? <laughs> we all work together, us three. Um, the verb might become is in the subjunctive mood. And the subjunctive mood is interesting because it reveals potential, not a reality. When God says that you might become partakers in the divine nature, guess what? It means there's something on your part that you have to put forth to become a partaker in that divine nature. All right? I'm not talking about providing your own salvation here. Don't, don't confuse that. I'm talking about being like God, having the very nature, the very characteristics, which are the very core of his being. And everybody, if you're excited about God, you'll want to share in these. For us to see growth or manifestation of this divine nature that we're sharing, there must be an effort on our part during the sanctification process. All right? That's where the simple addition part comes in that I talked about earlier. That you've got to put forth this effort to overcome sin in your life. You've got to put forth this, this effort to get out of the pit that you're in. You've got to put forth the effort to climb that mountain that's sitting ahead. You've got a major surgery coming. You've got a terminal illness. You've got whatever it is. You've just been told, I don't love you anymore and I'm leaving you. You've got a major mountain ahead of you. And you can get so discouraged in your faith and you can throw in the towel. But you're not going to. I know you're not going to. Kepha goes on to tell him in uh, verses 5 through 7. He says, for this very reason, make every effort to. Probably read over that one too, right? Make every effort to. What that word, what, what, well, for what reason are we to make every effort to first so that we might become partakers of God's divine nature? It's referring back to that passage. The words make every effort refer to doing something with all diligence. That means be quick to do it. Get up now and do it right now. Don't sit where you're at any longer. You'll be eaten alive. That means you have to exert the energy. You have to put forth what is needed to get from point A to point B. And guess what? God's going to be there supplying everything you need as you go along. We begin with faith as the basis of our relationship with God. But we have to do what the Lord asks us, and that means to be diligent to live out our faith. This is our part that we play in this spiritual relationship. It means personal involvement and energy expended. And so what are we to be diligent to do? What are we to make every effort to do? He goes on in 5.7. He says, to add to your faith. The word add here is the Greek word epikoregio, which indicates that we have to lavishly supply or furnish abundantly. That's right. And what I like about this word, once again, God is smarter than us. He puts it in the imperative mood. That means it's a command. Don't you sit still when God is telling you this right now. Don't you go from here today or sit where you're at and go back and sulk because you're facing this in your life. Start moving forward. It's a command from God. You might not respect me, you might not know me, and that's okay, but this is the very word of God speaking to you, not me. So, are you going to be obedient to him, or are you not going to be obedient to him? Uh, uh, it's up to you. It's totally up to you. The choice really is ours when you think about it. We can sit and we can waller and stuff, we can you just continually worry about stuff and we can say, hey, I'm not, I, that's not me, I can't do this. I could have I still been where I was years ago. You know, at 24, 25 years old, thinking I'm going to hide behind the scenes and not do anything. But then I could have probably robbed someone of a word of encouragement today, this many years down the road. So I'm glad I stepped forward. So the question is, are you willing to put forth the effort? Are you going to just sit there and accept mediocrity in your faith, and if not, be swallowed up by that huge whirlpool or quicksand or sit in the holding pattern spiritually in your life? I can't answer that. You know what? I'm so glad Yeshua put forth the effort. I'm so glad that he allowed his soul to be deeply grieved to the point of death. I'm glad that he allowed himself to be betrayed by someone that was close to him. I'm glad that he endured the ridicule being spat upon, the beatings, the scourgings, the nails being driven into his hands and feet, the insults hurled at him. And I'm so glad, and I'm so glad that he took up my sins and the sins of mankind 
something he had never experienced upon himself before. And through his obedience and through his effort put forth, you and I now have access to the Father. We're now back in a restored relationship with the Father. We have his righteousness imparted to us. We have his very spirit imparted to us. We have his grace and peace in abundant measure. We have everything we need pertaining to life and to godliness. And we can share in his moral excellence and his glory. And we have his magnificent promises, his precious promises. And we can all be partakers of his divine nature if we're willing to put forth the effort. The question is, are you? We're going to continue this message next week. And so I know that some of you will go from here and just tune it out, and tune it off. And guess what? I don't know you, God. I'm going to pray through the week that God makes you so stinking uncomfortable that you have to come back here, whether you, whether you have to stream it from your home or you walk in the door and watch Oh, short me. Hey, they told me I was, I was a good camera person this morning. I said, why is that? They said, because you don't move. You stay in one spot. <laughs> I laughed. I said, well, <laughs> never mind. <laughs> I'll accept that. I am not a good camera person, visually or... <laughs> no, I, maybe I am. I don't know. But I pray. I do. I pray God makes you uncomfortable. It's good to be uncomfortable. It really is. You know, it's the times in my life where I was uncomfortable that I grew. Isn't it the truth? So don't, afford, don't avoid the conflict. Don't avoid the, the, the adversities, the difficulties that God sends your way. You're there for a reason. And I don't care how old you are. You could be 20, 30, 40, 50, 90. Brother Billy, God's still molding and shaping, isn't he? I know he is. He's doing it to all of us. So if you would, please stand. And I, I will see you next week, Lord willing. Grab a hand. That's right, Mike, it takes effort, right? <laughs> Gotta get way over here. All right. Father, just bless my brothers and sisters here today. Uh, you know their needs. You know what they need, Father. Beyond any of us, they could come and tell us they're doing great and everything's fine. And Deep down, Father, they're struggling. And so, Father, we just, we just ask that you pour within them everything they need, every single thing. Everything we talked about, everything your word promises us to get going forward again. Uh, do that for our brothers and sisters. And for those that are watching uh, online, streaming as well, those that will come across this message maybe, who knows, months, years down the road and find themselves in a pit, Lord, pour into their lives at that special time. We need you so desperately. We just need you. We couldn't, you alone as... Someone said, you alone have the words of life. Who else are we going to turn to, Father? It's you and you only. So we do that every day. Help us to do that. Help us to put forth the effort to serve you and to love you with all of our whole heart, soul, mind, and strength. And Lord, when it's all said and done, we'll be able to look back and have a testimony for you. Not for anything that brings us glory or honor and praise, but it brings you the glory, honor, and praise. And that's what we want to do with our lives, to praise you, to bless you, to be living sacrifices for you. Nothing compares to serving you, Father. Nothing. And it is the sweetest thing to know that you can use us. That's right. We all want to be needed. And I know there's hurting hearts out here that just want to be needed, Father. And you want to use them in a desperate way. So, Lord, I just ask that you will bless and keep my brothers and sisters and that you will cause your face to shine upon them and be gracious to them and lift up your countenance upon them as you always do. And give them your peace. Father, I invoke the name that's above every other name upon the people that are here today. Even my life, my whole family's life. The people that are watching and the people that will hear this message. Shalom. Shabbat shalom, everybody.